So we'll try and have a, a sound and light and fireworks show just to keep uh, this metaboanalyst module uh, engaging. I think um, Jeff's done a really nice job of introducing statistics to you and a lot of what metaboanalyst is about is trying to use the statistical tools uh, that you've just learned about uh, but to make them very easy um, to handle and very easy to to use basically pointing and clicking. Um, so most of today will be devoted to Metaboanalyst. I will talk about it, I'll introduce it to you, uh, and then your, your lab for the rest of the day, or most of the rest of the day, will be focused on using Metaboanalyst. So um, in this case, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the standard data analysis workflow for Metabolomics, just to, so you can understand the basic layout for Metaboanalyst, because it is structured and it's intended to be sequential to follow or guide you through um, uh, a standard data analysis workflow. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the things in involved with data integrity checking, uh, detecting outliers, some QC or quality control, uh, normalization, transformation, scaling, centering, um, and then the multivariate statistics. And, and, and we'll use uh, several examples um, just to show you how the data analysis can be done. Now, uh, in addition to this introduction to Metabolist, I, I think we sent out um, a, a chapter uh, from current protocols in bioinformatics which describe Metabolist. Did anyone see that or download that? Or I don't know if we got that text. Um, but anyways, it goes through um, screenshot by screenshot and page by page through uh, Metaboanalyst. And uh, I think we were going to make that available for the pre-reading, but we'll try and maybe make that available for you for the lab uh, as soon as possible. Um, so in a typical metabolomics experiment, um, you will work with both biological replicates and technical replicates. Um, so if you're working with cases and controls, as an example, so the pink and blue cases and, and controls, um, there might be, you know, 40 cases and 40 controls. Uh, you don't usually do an experiment with one case and one control. So the 40 cases, the 40 controls are biological replicates. Uh, now you'll also uh, occasionally do things called technical replicates, and this is often part of your quality control and quality assurance process, where you'll be, uh, in some cases, taking a couple of extra samples and rerunning them at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. Um, sometimes you'll remeasure them. Some people standardly do technical replicates for everything, um, just to ensure that there's good reproducibility. And this is particularly it, uh, true for untargeted metabolomics, where quality control is, is really crucial. Uh, for targeted metabolomics, um, you generally don't need to do that many technical replicates, although it is a good idea to have some QC samples. So biological replicates help give you the numbers uh, to get some statistical assurance, uh, to get good p-values, to address the issues of false discovery. Um, as we talked about yesterday, there are basically two routes for metabolomics. And there's the targeted approach, and then there's the non-targeted or chemometric or profiling approach. And again, we went through both techniques yesterday where we did targeted GCMS, we did targeted NMR, and then we did untargeted LCMS. So with the data workflow, and I, I mentioned this before, and I'll, I'll repeat it, um, there are differences in the workflow. So untargeted metabolomics uh, you'll look for the quality of the data, you check to see if it's, you know, everything was measured, if there's actually real values in your data matrix. Um, then you'll do all kinds of spectral binning and alignment, that's what we did with um, um, uh, XCMS. Uh, there'll be some normalization, uh, some quality control, outlier removal, then the statistics, data reduction, data analysis. And then when all is said and done, then you're going to try and identify your features. 
targeted methods. We'll do some quick data integrity checks at the very beginning. Then you do the compound ID and quantification. Then you do the data normalization, QC. And then you do the data reduction and analysis. So there is a difference in orders. And basically, the situation is that one does identification at the beginning, the other does identification at the end. So what's data integrity and quality checking? So in the case of LCMS and GCMS, uh, we talked about this before. You went through this as well in real time with the XMS demo. Uh, there are lots of false positive peaks. And we went through some of this issue where you're seeing adducts, where you're going to see neutral losses. You're going to see isotope patterns. Um, you're going to have other things that will produce false positives. Uh, NMR, uh, you don't have that problem. Um, so we didn't dwell on that with the NMR analysis. Um, and in order to, to process these things and to deal with those false positives, we went through some examples. Uh, there's tools, many mass spec instruments that help facilitate that, and there are also tools that are online to do that. We also went through the process of data alignment and spectral uh, alignment. We saw how it's done or typically done for LCMS, can be done for GCMS. Uh, there is some issue with uh, NMR uh, as well, where there is some need for spectral alignment. Uh, and that's a, a result of pH variations. Uh, again, we saw some programs that did that, and, and most of the alignment tools are based on what's called time warping. Um, there are also processes, um, not so common now, but still done in, in some groups and in some projects, where uh, spectra will be binned. And that means they break them up into bins. And this is to just reduce the data size, the data matrix size. In this case, we're cutting up um, this spectrum to, I don't know, about 15 different bins. And in each bin, we just basically measure the overall area uh, under each peak. And we give a position, a chemical shift, or, or retention time, or mass to charge value. Um, and uh, that has essentially simplified what might have been 3,000 data points to, in this case, 14 bins. So this is a simple data reduction method. Uh, it's used. You'll see it's used in some cases for data with uh, metaboanalyst. And a number of groups still use this. Um, another thing that, that, that Jeff mentioned, uh, and this comes into the field of what we call data normalization, scaling, centering, and transformation. And it's, um, it's really confusing, uh, I think, for everyone, uh, because in fact, uh, the, the same words mean different things um, to different people. Um, and I'll apologize right now, because sometimes I will slip into talking about normalizing when it's also sort of scaling uh, or transforming. Um, so normalization in, in the world of physics uh, and math um, often means um, um, adjusting things so that they have a, a minimum and a maximum that's you know between zero and one or zero and a hundred, um, but that can also be called scaling. Uh, again, you just adjust things so that everything is uh, on a different unit of measurement. Normalization in statistics normally actually means uh, converting something that was a, a skewed distribution into a normal or Gaussian distribution. So that's a fundamentally different definition. Um, so this is where there's a, a problem. And then people also use the term transformation to do the same thing. It converts a skewed distribution into a normal or Gaussian distribution. So these are terms that are confusing, and they're used in the literature kind of haphazardly, and again, it's with different, different disciplines and different fields mean that. So um, an example where you have to deal with normalization, scaling, and transformation is when you've got things that are diluted. So this can happen with urine. It doesn't happen with blood. It happens with saliva. It happens with uh, cell culture media. It can happen with cell cultures. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that sometimes, in this example, there's a, a concentrated sample and a dilute sample. You can see this, the signals are 
high in one and low in the other. So how do we adjust for dilution effects? Um, and there are different ways of doing that. Uh, adjusting for dilution, we might try and integrate the total area of all the peaks and say, well, we want to have generally about the same area. In the case of urine, uh, people will measure uh, the refractive index or the osmolarity or osmality. Uh, they will also calculate um, the specific gravity. Um, so all of those are, are ways of normalizing or scaling or adjusting um, so that this, the dilution effects are consistent across uh, all samples. Um, because you can easily end up in a situation where the cases have very dilute urine and the controls have very concentrated urine and all you're detecting is simply that fact. And uh, that has often nothing to do with the condition. It might be that the cases were very thirsty and the controls weren't. Um, so you can also put in internal standards that will adjust this. Uh, in NMR, we often put in a DSS standard. Uh, this helps us adjust things if, if need be. People may weigh a sample. Uh, they may measure a volume of a sample to make sure things are consistent. Uh, this is actually probably the number one problem in metabolomics, is people not properly adjusting to dilution effects. Uh, so it's very important, and there are mathematical methods, <coughs> including probabilistic quotient methods, uh, which are also used. What you do and how you do it depends on the biofluid, depends on your capabilities within the lab, uh, depends on uh, how the samples have been prepared or uh, given to you. There are also situations where um, samples might look largely the same, but there's some uh, compound um, or several compounds that are 10 to 100 to 1,000 times higher in a certain sample. So here's one where this compound is perhaps 100 times greater than what it is in the, all, all the other ones. So this you might call an outlier, but perhaps for several people it's way off the scale, or so for animals or plants it's way off the scale. So this is a way of helping to manage these outliers, and this is what skews your distributions a lot. And so when you have a skewed distribution, that's when you start using these log transformations, or auto-scaling, or Pareto-scaling or probabilistic quotient methods, or range scaling. And that helps bring things in so that they look like normal distributions. So you can see where I'm, again, mixing terms. Well, I'll say scaling, normalizations, transformation. I'll say, well, this is converting something so it's a normal distribution. In other cases, I'm saying normalization, scaling, transformation to say, let's adjust for dilution. And that's a problem uh, of semantics and terminology that's unfortunate. but. Uh, hopefully, um, when we say normalization, scaling, transformation, and centering, uh, we put all of these things together to say, okay, we're just trying to make our data a little cleaner, uh, a little more normal, and also adjusting for quality control. So there's another phenomenon, which is part of this filtering. And filtering is, is not so much scaling or normalization. It's actually literally removing data. Um, so in many cases, removing data is legitimate. Getting rid of a water peak in NMR is legitimate. Getting rid of noise peaks in mass spec is legitimate. Um, getting rid of those false positives, which are essentially part of the column matrix that come off of uh, GC or LC runs is legitimate. But it still needs some justification. You have to be explaining why. And unfortunately, there's lots of people who just think uh, removal of data is standard practice. Just take an eraser and remove the outlier, and it's gone. Um, and that's all you need to, to, to do. But you ultimately have to explain why. And um, more for my data, actually, yeah. we run for uh, any even hundred metabolites from uh, more than 100 patients. Mm -hmm. So we found some uh, data is missing, like no data. So mm -hmm. Can remove that? No, not necessarily. Um, and this is where people have to be aware of issues where if there is no data, it can either mean that in some cases it's below the limit of detection, 
and in that regard, um, removing that, you know, if, if you've identified that this is a, I don't know, alanine or something like that, um, it, uh, it, it, it's probably there. Uh, it's, it's a compound that's essential to life. Um, and then by, say, removing all alanines from all of your analyses, because there were a few cases that you didn't have uh, detectable measurements for it, is, is erroneous, but also could lead you to some false conclusions. So typically what people will do is they'll take the lower limit of detection and divide by <coughs> 2, and gives the lower limit, uh, or put in a, essentially a fake value, or a synthetic value, so that that collection of, of metabolites can still be considered as, as part of the, the statistics and as, as part of the analysis. Now there's a point where if you have too many uh, compounds that are below the limits of detection, and that could be around 20 to 30 percent, at that point you've reached a stage where probably uh, the instrument's not effective enough, the assay isn't effective enough, and so it is probably wise to just remove it. Uh, entirely from, from the analysis. Um, but that needs justification. You need to say or explain explicitly what you've done and why you've done it. Uh, and if you don't say why, people are going to look at your raw data and say, you know, what are you thinking? What were you doing? Um, like um, in my case, it's 6%. I already calculated 6% data, so that is not so much. That's right. But the uh, problem is uh, if I include this uh, data, my data is actually LCM is that. Mm -hmm. So if I include this data and if it is appear in the final biomarker, that one will not be again detectable. That one will not again be detectable. Like uh, as uh, some is not detectable here, uh, if we design some uh, diagnostic panel or something, that will not be uh, possible for low. No, it's, it's certainly, it is certainly possible. And when you've got 6%, that's legitimate, and you can use that as a biomarker. And obviously, you like to try and make your assay over time a little more sensitive. But um, if that's an effective biomarker or part of an effective biomarker panel at, at 94%, um, <coughs> having something below the limit of detection and then giving it a value of half that, that is completely legitimate. To, to include that as a biomarker. It's, it's commonly done even in things like um, qualitatively in, in um, inborn errors in metabolism. There are things that they may look for uh, that are absent. And they say, I can't find it, therefore this person has this disease. The system can't detect it, but that's the, that's the test. If you can't just see it, it's, it's, um, it's part of the test. So. Um, anyways, I, we could go on and on about that, and we can talk about that maybe in the lab. So uh, data filtering, as I said, is one that, that um, again, people make many mistakes on. Um, dimensional reduction, was PCA and PLSDA, something that um, uh, Jeff talked about. And we also talked a little bit about clustering uh, as well, which, again, helps with similarity detection. All of these tools, these techniques that we introduced have been incorporated into Metaboanalyst. Uh, so maybe before going into this, how many people have actually used Metaboanalyst? Mm -hmm. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. About half or two-thirds. So just for context, um, Metaboanalyst is actually um, the most widely used analytical tool for metabolomics. Uh, it has, I think, an average of <coughs> six or 7,000 users per day, every day. Um, and uh, roughly a third of all papers published in the field of metabolomics use uh, Metaboanalyst. Um, so it was developed by Jeff uh, while well, he was in my lab, and now he's continuing to develop it um, at, in his lab at McGill. So what it does is it's a web server, and that was the novel part about it, is it took uh, metabolomics analysis out from having to have custom software that you paid lots of money for, uh, and it put it online. And the second thing it did was it made it very easy and very visual. Um, it's also very general. 
that works for LCMS and GCMS and NMR. It's particularly suited for targeted metabolomics, but you can put any type of data, including untargeted data, into MetaboAnalyst and it'll work. So the first version came out in 2009 and that introduced most of the major statistical techniques that, that uh, uh, Jeff explained. Uh, it introduced a lot of the color plots, it introduced the workflow. Version 2 uh, added a number of other tools for higher level interpretation. Um, tabulite set enrichment, and pathway analysis, and um, rock curve analysis. And then 2015 uh, enhanced things much, much more, improved the, the performance overall, uh, added power analysis, integrated with gene expression, and so on. So that's the current version. Um, and it's always being improved uh, with Jeff working on additions and then my lab as well doing a few things to update it. So what we'll do here is, is talk about the, an overview and then you guys will have a chance in the lab uh, for a few hours this afternoon to, to give it a try. Um, so we'll look at raw data processing, we'll look at what's called data reduction or dimension reduction and statistical analysis. We'll look at enrichment analysis, pathway analysis, power analysis, biomarker analysis, and we really won't have time really to get into integrative analysis. So Metabol Analyst is divided into eight major modules, um, and it's too small for me to see, but so there's each of them, there's statistical analysis, pathway analysis, uh, enrichment analysis, um, targeted pathway analysis, integrated pathway analysis, and so on. Each of these you can select very easily, um, and uh, they are all part of a general workflow that takes you through data pre-processing, data normalization, data reduction and data analysis, that's the statistics, and then data or pathway interpretation. And they're all different, I mean they all may sound all the same, but in fact they are distinct and this is sort of embodied here where you can think about the modules. So the blue boxes at the top represent the different types of input, so it could be GC or LCMS raw spectra, it could be peak lists, it could be bins, which we just talked about, or peak tables, or it can be concentrations. And as I say, generally, if you can get relative or absolute concentration data, that's the most efficient because it's a small data set um, and it's much more informative. It will do a variety of things. Uh, it'll do name mapping, name normalization. We'll see some examples of that. It'll look for the data integrity. It'll also, if necessary, deal with peak alignment or peak detection. It'll go all the data, that, no matter whether it's LC, GC, NMR, raw lists, peak lists, or whatever, it will go through some sort of data filtering step and then you as a user have to do data normalization and transformation and scaling. We'll talk about that. From that then you can do a variety of multivariate statistical analysis, you can do time series analysis, we won't talk about that, we'll do biomarker analysis, you can do power analysis, pathway analysis, metabolite set enrichment analysis, integrated pathway analysis, and then other utility functions that also can deal with um, batch effects and batch corrections. Again, we won't have time to do that in, in the demo, or at least in today's discussion, but you can do that in the lab. So if you go to Metabo Analyst and you just type the name and anywhere, it'll take you to this website. Um, and it looks like this. And um, it's, I think that the toughest part about using Metabolanalyst Analyst is, is finding out how to start it. Um, so you have to look in this little tiny spot, which is click here to start. And I've been asking Jeff for almost six years to make the I'm font sort of bigger. On, this, <laughs> <laughs> um, on the side um, is a list of um, um, hyperlinks, which allows you to navigate through the system. Uh, so that's on the left with the arrow. Then Jeff keeps uh, a steady update of what's new, what's been added, things that are changed, and then there's the citation information below it. So if you click on the data formats key, um, 
you'll see some example data sets. And this has been really important, and this is something that you guys will use, hopefully. You can also use the data you generated yesterday, your own data if you want. But if you just want to get a feel for this, um, there's a whole range of data sets, example data sets coming from our lab that you can use, uh, and you can download them. Um, and some of them are in different styles or formats. Um, some will be compound concentrations, some could be raw spectra, some could be bin, some could be whatever. Um, so you can download them if you wish, or you can also um, use an interactive tool which is, as you get in, also has example data sets for each of the uh, specific um, analyses. And again, that's, that's very useful for people to get a, a feel for how to, to use a uh, metaboanalyst. So let's get into some metabolomic data processing. So you've started or you've found the metaboanalyst data site. Um, and what you're going to do initially is um, um, start converting uh, the, the raw data form into a matrix that's suitable for statistical analysis. In most cases, if you're using your own data, it's going to be in an Excel format or a comma-separated uh, value format or CSV format. Uh, so it has to be in a table, and you can have concentration tables, peak lists, bin lists, or raw spectra. We're going to focus, just for simplicity, uh, on the target analysis, so these are concentration tables. It can be absolute concentration or relative concentration. So even the XCMS data you guys had yesterday could be put in this format because it would be uh, um, peak values or integrated values. So it has to have a, a label and a, and a number. Uh, sure. So, for the previous slide, so today I just able the raw spectrum for today because some people, I don't want people to upload the raw spectrum and it will slow down the thing. So we use our other peak list spectrum. So we already yesterday we used the raw spectrum, XMS, 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 Multiple times, <laughs> bringing hundreds of computers down. <laughs> so yeah, since we're going to have 30 people using this at once, we want to try and keep it fairly uh, free. Um, anyways, the um, uh, if you go in to you know click here to enter, this is the first screen you're going to see, and it's going to be actually eight panels. I can only show six, but uh, from here what you do is click on statistical analysis. Top left corner, um, which should be the natural thing you should do because you all read from top to bottom, from left to right. Um, so um, once, in, once you've clicked that panel, what you're going to see is, is this screen here. Um, there's going to be a little window on the left, which is hyperlinked, which is a process window that takes you through steps. It's step one, step two, step three, four, five, and six. Um, so that first step is upload. And you have two options. Uh, one is to just take a tab delimited file. The other is to take a zip file. Um, and you can um, uh, take those files that you've downloaded, files that you generated yesterday, um, as you wish, or if you scroll down that, that window a little further, there's this second option, which is try our test data. And this is a case, if you're just trying to get a feel for metabolism, this is the best way to do it. Scroll down, click on one of these test data sets. And I'm going to use this one, and that's the one number two, which is uh, one which will automatically be uploaded. So it's already sitting on the server. It's, you don't have to use your computer and upload it. But as I say, there's two options. One is to take the data you just generated yesterday, put it in, or take the data that's given there free for you to try. So the data that I'm using here in this example is from uh, dairy cattle that were fed different proportions of cereal grains, basically barley. Uh, and in Canada, we feed, and actually the U.S. as well, most cattle are fed uh, grain to supplement their diet. But cattle in, say, Ireland or many parts of Europe and Australia and New Zealand are fed <coughs> mostly grass. And there's a difference that they've noticed in terms of the health of the cows 
and the longevity. And certainly as you increase the grain concentration, the cows get increasingly uncomfortable and also seem to have a number of disorders. So they wanted to figure out what is it that's, that's happening when you increase grain in cattle. Now grain is very energy rich and the, the, the assumption is that if you could lots of, get cattle to eat lots of grain they'd grow quicker. They appear to, but it's uh, obviously with some cost to the general health. So they decided to look at the rumen. So this is the, 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 the gut fluid, if you want, um, in cattle. Uh, they're ungulates, they have these multi-chambered stomachs and uh, a few gallons of, of rumen that's in each cow, and this processes the grass into fuel and food and methane. Um, and uh, we used NMR to analyze this. So the first thing we've done is once we've uploaded that one, it'll immediately bump us um, to this screen here, which is doing a data integrity check. And it'll say, you know, it's looking to see uh, what data is in what column and what row, samples are in rows, um, features, meaning the um, uh, compounds are in columns. Um, the, um, uh, it'll tell you whether it's comma separated or not. If you've messed up in the file format, it'll complain, and then you can go back and reformat your file. Uh, it'll look to see if there are some things that are empty, whether there's some missing values. Uh, in this case the data is quite clean and so we accept all of the uh, small adjustments that uh, the data integrity check and so we say skip. So we now have um, you know, a list of cows in rows and all of the compounds or compound concentrations in columns um, and there's probably 50 or 60 uh, chemicals and uh, I don't know there's about seven or eight cows for each of the different um, states uh, that were fed 0%, 15 or 10, 20 and 40 uh, percent cereal grains. This is the next step which is probably the, the, one of the more confusing parts for anyone doing statistics um, and this is the scaling transformation normalization step. So this is trying to deal with, yes, there are probably some dilution effects with the rumen. Sometimes people didn't get as much rumen as they wanted, or uh, the needle aspirate didn't do a great job. Uh, then there's also some of these compounds, which are 100 to 1,000 times higher in concentration than all the other compounds. So we're trying to deal with dilution effects. We're trying to deal with skewed distributions of metabolites. And so you have different options um, where you're going to try and do uh, either normalization, scaling, transformation. And you can think of it as, as row-wise normalization and column-wise normalization or sample normalization with respect to the, the compounds and normalization with respect to the different cattle um, which may have been dilute or not so dilute. In this case, we've chosen some specific numbers. We've chosen to do normalization by a pooled sample. This helps to deal with some of the dilution effects. We didn't do any log transformation, but we did decide to do some auto-scaling, which helps center the data a little bit and also improves the distribution. And we could have tried clicking a whole bunch of these things until we got something that looks decent. And we'll show you what you're trying to do. But just with data normalization, as I say, you've got these samples in rows and the compounds or peaks or bins in the columns with their corresponding concentrations. Um, and as I say, you can do this row-wise normalization, column-wise normalization, or a combined normalization. The rows, we're just trying to deal with the dilution effect. That's row-wise normalization. Um, that's the top one. The column-wise normalization is to try and deal with making things normally distributed. So that's the log transformation, the Pareto scaling transformation, uh, auto scaling, and so on. So if we didn't touch the data at all, what we would have got is this on the left. And you can see that this is showing the, com the compounds and their concentrations and their concentration ranges in box plots. 
and you can see that most of the concentrations are really small, 10 to 50 micromolar, and then there's a few that are up on the order of a millimolar, or 10 to 100 times higher than any other ones. This creates a very skewed distribution. So Jeff showed you an example of a skewed distribution. This is really skewed. So everything's lined up on the left, and then there's a few way off to the right. So by using the scaling functions, by doing both row and column normalization and centering, we've now changed the data. So instead of looking really skewed, it looks like a bell curve. It's Gaussian. And it's now plotted in the same box plot to the right. And you can see everything is sort of, um, you know, it's visible, uh, unlike the one on the left. Uh, they have a range, there's a standard deviation, you can see the, the quartile sets. Um, and when you plot out the entire distribution, which is shown at the bottom, you can see this bell shape curve. So this is critical for doing statistics. As I said, if you didn't do this, you would be dealing with non-normalized uh, data, and essentially all of your calculations would be grossly in error. Statistics was not designed to work with skewed distributions. It was designed to work with normal distributions. Yes? To, to obtain a better distribution of your data, do you have any suggestion of flowchart how to play with these different possibilities? Um, there's not really. Um, usually if you see something like many combinations will work just fine. So this one isn't going to be, you know, you always have to do it. Um, I, I think if you're dealing with urine or some other sample, uh, you might want to try normalizing to some external sample. So this is something you, you have to design in your experimental design. And you'd have that either creatinine or something like that. If you're working with uh, you know, cell samples, you should normalize to the weight the dry or wet weight of the samples. Uh, if it's working with um, fecal or stool samples, again, the, the tendency now is people normalize to a, a wet weight of material. Um, fruits <coughs> and vegetables, people will work with wet weight. And so that's one way of normalizing or scaling. Then when you're dealing with concentrations, uh, log scaling works really well most of the time. Um, auto scaling works really well most of the time. What Jeff has done recently is he's made this interactive. So in the old days it was kind of tedious, uh, and if you guessed wrong then you'd spend hours going backwards, but this one you can do this in a few, like, I don't know, 30 seconds, you can see whether your first guesses worked or not. Assessing whether this looks normal is really up to your, your eye. It's, this is where statistics becomes a bit of an art. And I, I usually say statistics is it's the mathematics of intuition. It just formalizes what we might in, intuitively see uh, in, a, in a mathematical framework. And this is another example of intuition. Does this look Gaussian to you? Some of you would say, no, it's not enough. I want to do some more. Okay, you can. You're working with a slightly different distribution, and, and depending on what you've done, you will get slightly different results. Not profoundly, but slightly different results, depending on what you've done to, to normalize and scale. Just to follow up on that, yes. would you recommend this visual interpretation is, is enough, or would you run like normality and home elasticity tests? You could, it's just that we don't have that on Metabol Analyst. And uh, yes, I mean, some people have done that, and this is something you could bug Jeff to, to add, um, at least to generate that. Non-regularity normality, I don't think there's a solution. Like, as an individual, right? But individual normal distribution can be guaranteed non-regularity normality.
All normalization is you see like one applied to everyone. If we don't treat individual features, each this feature uses this normalization, that feature uses that normalization. And if you really want to do that, you I mean, you can. But it's a, it would, if you put on a software tools allow you to apply different features, uh, algorithms on different features, and that's going to be so complex. And you can do it, but it's you will not recommend it for that on the state <laughs> So I think in the interest of time, we'll, we'll have to move on because we're already behind time and also I think we need to try and get, get caught up. But it is a, it's an interesting issue, uh, but I think Jeff's given a very good answer. So as I said, we've, we've got a new version for uh, Metabolo Analyst, you know, version 3.1, whatever. Um, that allows you to interactively do this. It is important to do it visually. After you've done this scaling, transformation, normalization, you want to be able to look at this data a little bit closer and to do a little bit more quality control checking. And this is to, to look to see if there are any outliers. Now in some cases people will do this visually or uh, initially when they first prepare their data matrix. Some may have noticed it when they were collecting their data. Uh, but many don't. Uh, there's also a case where we try to do some noise reduction, uh, especially when you're dealing with, with raw spectral data from uh, mass spec or, or GCMS, LCMS. So this is what happens, or you can do, uh, you can use some PCA analysis, uh, or you can do some heat map analysis at the very, very beginning to look to see if there's an outlier or two. And this is an example where we've done principal component analysis, and there are, in this case, two clusters, a red and a green cluster, and then there's something way off on the right, which is marked with the arrow. Or in the case of the heat map, we're seeing a, a heat map of metabolites, um, different groups, the red and the green group, and everything's kind of, you know, gray, blue, slightly red. And then you see this dark streak all the way across in this heat map. That's another way of detecting an outlier. And this could be a case where, um, uh, in this particular example, uh, maybe it was a wrong sample. Uh, maybe instead of urine, it was, was plasma and someone mixed it up. Uh, maybe in this case, um, it was highly dilute or highly concentrated because someone had added too much of the, the diluent or concentrated un unknowingly. Um, but this is an example where this will mess up your data. It's, it's a mistake. Ideally, you'd like to understand how the mistake was made. Um, and in that respect, if you can, then at least you can justify removing it. So you can go in and remove data uh, using a data editor, or you can just go to your Excel spreadsheet and remove the data. Um, but if you're already into metabolites, then you can use, you can navigate down this um, navigation panel on the right and you can go into the data editor and, and you can do that editing. You can also do some noise reduction. This data filtering step is to get rid of some of the additional data that maybe you didn't get rid of as part of, say, your XCMS processing. Uh, and again, there's a couple of options for the data reduction or noise reduction. Um, typically, you're looking for things that have very, very low intensities. These are the things that are near the lower limit of detection. 
things that have essentially no variance, so it's the same value over and over and over again in every single sample, which probably indicates that that's some contaminant that was washed through, um, or something that is you know, incredibly high in one sample, incredibly low in another sample, incredibly high in another one, incredibly low, that's uh, very little repeatability. Those are trends or features that says there's something wrong with this particular peak, this particular feature. And that is very problematic with LCMS data. Um, and it can be problematic with GCMS data. It's not a problem with NMR data. So um, those are some tricks and some tools that are available in uh, Metaboanalyst to get rid of some of the data that's uninformative noise. Okay, so that's cleaning up your data, that's getting it normalized, which is probably the most important step. And then you're ready essentially for the data reduction and the statistical analysis. So the data reduction and statistical analysis allows you to find those interesting features, those significantly changed peaks or concentration. It allows you to look for certain patterns or trends you can maybe assess differences between different phenotypes. You can classify, you can predict. So we're going to look at a number of the ones that, that Jeff mentioned. Uh, these ANOVA techniques, multivariate statistics. We'll also look at clustering. So after you've completed your scaling, and if you didn't have to do any uh, further data cleanup, you now have this option, um, which is in your statistical set. And there's about a dozen different options, and what's marked in these arrows are some of the ones that we'll try. We'll look at analysis of variance, we'll look at um, PCA, and we'll look at PLSDA, and then we'll look at um, heat mapping. So first one we'll do is ANOVA, and the reason why we're doing ANOVA is because we're not looking at cases and controls, we're looking at four different uh, dairy cow populations, so that's n is greater than 2. 0%, 15, 30, and 45 percent. So we're just trying to identify those that are different between all groups um, or just between the 0 percent group and all the other ones where they have grain. And there's again different types of ANOVAs that you can do. So simply by pressing the ANOVA button on the left you get this. Uh, it'll take a second or two and it'll produce a, a plot, a scatter plot in the bottom and what the scatter plot is showing you is, is the um, log of the p-value. So uh, you want something that's you know less, uh, or this is a log base 10. So you want something that's um, above that dashed line uh, to be relatively significant. But then the ones that are way high up are very, very significant. Uh, you can click on these dots. And by clicking on the dot, a little box plot uh, appears up in the upper right. In this case, this, this is 3-phenyl propionic acid, 3-PPP. Um, and it shows you the concentration differences uh, at 0, 15, 30, and 40. Uh, and you can see there's a pretty obvious difference, um, and it's pretty significant. Um, you can also um, go a little further, scrolling down, looking at, at, the, at the plots. Uh, you can click at, on individual uh, compounds here. Here we've clicked on uracil. In that table it's giving you um, a p-value uh, as well as the false discovery rate, the FDR. And that's usually of more interest because we're looking at multiple variables. Uh, and you'd like to have FDRs that are below um, 0.05 as a rule. Again, it's showing some plots. Again, there's some obvious trends, some obvious differences. Uh, so these are significant. So uracil is significantly different among the four. So you can basically explore. And this is what I think is really useful about Metaboanalyst. It allows you to browse through. So you're seeing how different certain things are. You can see whether there are trends, whether it's one that's different than all others, or whether there's a linear trend. Zero is less than 15, which is less than 30, which is less than 40, uh, or whether they're all the same. And um, you can also go from just the, the analysis of these box, plot, box plots to another one, which is just the correlation link, which is done as a heat map. 
and to see how certain metabolites have varied between different groups. Uh, so it's a symmetric plot, which is what you expect, um, and looking at things that are in the red zone or in the blue zone, allowing you to distinguish that. You can also generate not just the visual HTML image, but a high resolution image if you need to do that for a paper or a poster. Um, so again, you're navigating on the left side um, fairly easily to do some of these uh, things, and everything is point and click. So there's no coding. Um, and uh, in this case, once you've chosen that, you can download it uh, to your computer as a PNG or um, a scalable vector graphic or a PDF as you wish. So that's ANOVA. Another thing you can do, which is a little different than ANOVA, is to look at patterns and pattern analysis, especially when you're dealing with two, more than two groups. So you have 10 or 15 groups, and you want to see if there's some kind of trend. Uh, in this case, we're dealing with four, and so we're using something called Pattern Hunter. And this is showing some possible patterns. There's a linear pattern where, say, going from 0 to 15 to 30 to 40, the metabolite increases. You also have a situation at 0, the metabolite's low, and at 15 and 30, it's high, and then back at 40, it's low again. Or you could have the mirror image. Those are patterns. Um, so in this case, Pattern Hunter is a, an option, um, and again it's navigated on the left side, and we can choose a pattern. In this case we're just having a pattern that's designated as 1, 2, 3, 4, which is this linear one, low, medium, high. Um, and in essence all we're going to do is look for linear correlations. So we've chosen our simple pattern based on these four groups press submit, and then a second or two later, this pops up. And this is a graph that's showing the correlation coefficient, the linear correlation coefficient, Pearson correlation, of these different metabolites. So some climb with grain concentration, some do the opposite. So in this case we can see endotoxin and glucose climb, uh, they have the strongest linear correlation of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, uh, so they increase with grain concentration, whereas 3-phenylpyruvate um, and isobutyrate drop, and quite significantly, and they have the opposite trend. Uh, and you can choose where you would say something significant. You might say, I want a correlation of greater than 0.5 or 0.6, and you can say which one is the, the pattern that, that best matches this. So that's ANOVA, and that's sort of pattern analysis within no ANOVA. The next thing you can do is principal component analysis, and this is the first part of our, our multivariate statistics. So what we're doing is we click on the PCA link there, um, and we're going to look to see if the four groups separate. We're going to look at a scores plot and a loadings plot. They're two different plots, and Jeff chatted a, about it a little bit. Um, you can also look at these plots in 2D and in 3D. Uh, and there are a variety of viewing options. So again, you just click the PCA plot a few seconds later, this is what you would see. So it's already done the PCA analysis, and it's already created the ellipsoids that circle the different conditions. One in 0, 15, 30, and 40 percent, they're all colored. Um, now, if there wasn't any coloring, uh, it would probably look like a big mess. So this is sort of giving you some visualization to say, yes, there is a distinction. It's not profound, but certainly the 0% the uh, differs substantially from the 40%, and there's a bit of difference between the two. And you can see some tabs up at the top, and you can navigate with the different tabs. You can look at the scores plot, um, you can look at the overview, you can do a 3D plot, um, you can look at the loadings plot. So by clicking on the tabs, you can move back and forth. So if we click on the loadings plot, we see this graph. That's not as commonly shown, because it's not typically as colorful. But what you can see in this loading plot first is a scatter of, of points, but there's a trend. So if we go back, you can see that there's a, a left to right 
trend between the 0% and the 40%. So there's the bluish turquoise one, and then there's the red. So the trend in our scores plot from bottom left corner to top right corner is what we're seeing. So when we look at the loadings plot, it's the points that are at the bottom left corner and the top right corner that are driving the separation. So based on that trend that we saw, then we're going to click on the top right and the bottom left, and we're going to see which of those comp compounds are driving it. And lo and behold, uh, one of the top ones that we see is 3PP, that phenylpropionic or phenylpropionic acid. And uh, again, it's reiterating what we saw with the ANOVA. We can go back and say, okay, 2D plots are nice, 3D plots are cooler. Um, so we can click on the 3D plot, and this has also got a JavaScript visualization, so you can rotate it and see how the reds are separated from the dark blues and the greens. Uh, in some cases, the separations are quite profound when you go to 3D plots, and they aren't so obvious in the 2D plots. So it really helps to, to do this. Okay, so that's the PCA. We are seeing some separation. It's not great. But it's, it's, it's evident. We're also seeing some drivers that are, that are pushing these, these groups apart, certain compounds that are consistent. Let's go to the next bigger gun that we can use in our arsenal, um, and that's the PLSDA. So that's the one option below, and so we use this uh, to essentially try and maximize or optimize the separation we saw with the PCA. It's doing some linear uh, regression to, to do that. And as I said, and I think as Jeff has pointed out, PLSDA um, can be abused. It's, a, it's a, a classification technique as opposed to a separation technique. It, it's using information, and it can get essentially over-trained. So this is where you want to look at the Q-squared and R-squared values that tell you whether this is real or not, or to look at the VIP scores to see if some of these things are significant or not. Uh, Any time the VIP is greater than 1, I usually use 1.2 as a cutoff. That's significant. So you've clicked PLSDA again a few seconds later, and this is what you get. Um, in this case, you can see the separation is, is stronger. All of the ellipsoids are, are distinct now. They aren't really overlapping as they were with the PCA. Uh, they still have sort of the same left to right, upper, lower left, up to right trend. And you have the same sort of options where you can click on um, the scores, some data validation, a 3D plot, and so on. We can evaluate it by clicking on one of the tabs, and this will give us our R squared and Q squared. So these are sort of mystery statistics, I, I think, that were invented. Um, but everyone trusts them uh, for reasons I don't know. But in any case, if the R squared and Q squared um, are greater than about 0.7, then uh, your PLSDA is good. And so in this case, a three-component model gives you an R squared, Q squared that's uh, sufficiently good. And that's highlighted. Um, and that's essentially a stable model. Um, and that's quite robust. You can also look at the variable importance uh, plot, or VIP plot, and this identifies the compounds, again, that drive the separation. And once again, we see topping out the list is 3PP. Um, we also see things like glucose and lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin that also drives the separation. Um, so um, the PLSDA, in this case, is robust. Uh, it's identifying many of the compounds we saw through ANOVA um, and through PCA, and that's a good sign. If you're getting completely different things each time you press, that would either suggest um, that there's uh, no significance to what you're doing or the data you're seeing, uh, or that you hadn't uh, normalized things properly. Um, so, as I say, a validation of your your work is good is to basically see that whether it's ANOVA, PCA, or PLSDA, you're getting basically the same uh, answers. You can also, uh, and as Jeff pointed out, uh, beyond R squared, Q, Q squared, you can do what I think is a better technique, uh, which is permutation testing. Um, and so this will run um, 
a thousand permutations, and you can see the distribution here, uh, where most of the models that were generated uh, all had certain scores way down on the left, and then the one that was actually, um, you know, the real one, has a, a position way, way out to the right. So it's it's highly significant, much much smaller than 0 0.001 than the permutations, but it's it's clearly a robust. Uh, uh, model that's been generated. The last thing that we can do in this one, or the one I'm going to use in this example, you could do many others, but we'll just look at heat maps. And this is the hierarchical clustering approach. And it's another way of looking at multivariate data. Some people prefer it because it's perhaps a little more visual, a little closer to the way people think of microarrays or, or protein chips. Um, and it allows you to look at sort of the behavior of certain metabolites. So you can look at, see, which ones are low in group 0, but increased in group 35, or 30 and 45, and so on. So with the heat map, uh, you just click on the heat map on the, on the left side. Um, there's some default parameters, most of which you can just use as the default. But you can change the color scheme as well. So here's one which is a black, red, green. But if you're red, green, colorblind, this looks probably just all gray. Uh, so you can use the yellow, blue uh, schema and so on. And at the top, you can see how it's grouped the four different uh, cattle, the 0, 15, 30, and 40 percent, or 45 percent, um, in terms of the feed and then the metabolites that are clustered there. It's not a really distinct trend, at least that I can see with this, but um, again, it's every person has their own preference and choice. So we've gone through uh, ANOVA, we've gone through PCA, we've gone through PLSDA, we've looked at uh, Pattern Hunter, we've uh, done a few other tricks. So all of these have involved, you know, clicking, saving, clicking some gain, again, making some adjustments. Um, what's happened while you've been doing this, and what I think a lot of people appreciate, is it's, it's keeping track of all of the graphs, all the plots, all the parameters you've chosen. Um, so at this stage, you can ask it to write your paper. So you just press this, and there's your paper. <laughs> so uh, one problem is this: um, uh, automatically, it has been not generated with some R issues. So we have a button up, so you need to click generate report to actually do it. So. We used to just have staff people write the report and then send it to you, but not anymore. Um, so, anyways, this is important. So this is the has to do with traceability, provenance, reproducibility. Um, it, it, it tracks your workflow. Um, and a lot of people are trying to develop workflows so that there is that level of reproducibility. If you do this ad hoc with a whole bunch of different programs, and I used Excel for this, I used another program over here, and I used another one over here. Um, you know, perhaps in your paper or write-up or thesis, it'll it'll tell you in some detail. But I think that the key point is that to capture all of the parameters that you used and have that record is is very important. And that if someone wanted to be able to do this or reproduce your work, um, ideally you'd like to have that set to that parameter file available. And it, and it might be worthwhile, I don't know, for Jeff to consider this, but to have a record of of those parameter sets and whether they're ultimately archived for people. Um, it was in the original one. Uh, people can actually download them. We think about the record of the research. We have actually have the parameters. People can rerun it and get the same thing. But um, somehow we discussed that we didn't think there is same thing. But I, I think it's a good suggestion. Yeah, I think it's, again, more and more people are, this issue, this crisis of reproducibility in science, I think this is one of the things that people really are starting to push for, and so that if you can have that parameter set, and that would presumably be something that could be deposited into metabolites, and it could also be identified as a file in your supplementary material if you're, if you're publishing with it. But at least that guarantees reproducibility of, of, of data sets. Okay. Um, we're going to move into the next part. So that's statistics. That's where 90% of the activity of, of metaboanalyst is. Uh, but probably the most useful stuff is in the other 10%. And this is because I think people are so obsessed with PS, PLSDA and PCA. So one of the, the real gems of, of uh, metaboanalyst 
is this tool called enrichment analysis. And this is a concept that, that Jeff developed uh, from gene set enrichment analysis, which is well known. But we were trying to come up with a name for it, and we just call it metabolite set enrichment analysis. So it's sort of gotten a life of its own. Um, it's divided into three different techniques. One is over-representation analysis. Another one is called single sample profiling. And the other one is called quantitative enrichment analysis, which is probably a little closer to what uh, MSEA is about. In order to do enrichment analysis, you need to have really large data libraries. And these are ones that we've assembled through HMDB and through other data mining exercises over the last number of years. Although I don't know, when was the last time we've updated this? Okay. So there's a couple of years, but some of the data sets are a little older, and I think with the update to HMDB, we'll probably update some more of them. But some of them are, are quite unique, um, and, and there's quite a number of them that are available. So the idea here is not just to say, this is statistically significant, this is different. It's to say, well, what, does, what is 3PP, and is it important in some kind of pathway? Or, um, and so it's trying to link things primarily into pathways, diseases, or the localization of certain <coughs> metabolites. Some are only membrane-bound, some are only found on the liver, and so on. Um, so right now, because um, gene set enrichment and metabolite set enrichment require huge amounts of, of data archiving, the only thing we can do is support for humans. If someone wants to do it for E. coli or fish, feel free. But this has been an enormous effort, um, and not just from our group, from many groups, and has cost millions of dollars just to get the, the data sets. Um, so as I said, three types of data uh, analysis. So for over-representation analysis, you just need the metabolite names. So that's not much. Uh, for single sample profiling, you can just take a patient, a single person, and say, are they sick or are they healthy? Uh, and all this is doing is comparing metabolites with their con normal concentration ranges. And then the quantitative enrichment analysis <coughs> is to take a larger sample. And you've got lists and concentrations of metabolites, but for many people. So you can look at it this way. There's ORA, which is the simplest or weakest form of analysis. There's SSP, which is for individual patients. It could be you, it could be your friend. Um, and quantitative enrichment analysis, which is typically done as a, as a uh, medical study with, with multiple patients. Um, and again, this is patient-centric. It's human-centric, because this is the only place where we can get this kind of detailed data. As an example, we took some um, individuals who had lung and colon cancer. And they were suffering from a condition called cachexia, which is a muscle wasting. And this is the really the, essentially the, the major killer of cancer. Um, it's, people call it you know, dying from tumor burden. Um, but it is, it is the number one reason why people die from cancer. And in some cases, it, it appears to be um, preventable. Um, and perhaps there are nutritional interventions that can help <laughs> mitigate it. Yes? In the previous slide, um, where you mentioned uh, compound concentrations, yes. you actually need the actual concentrations, but if you have a case control and it's more like relative treatments, that doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. You could, in the case of compound uh, the overrepresentation analysis, you could. So if you've got something that's overrepresented, then it's essentially compound names. But in this case, the concentrations are, are critical because there's all this reference data that's in um, HMDB. So here we're doing overrepresentation analysis. Uh, we're using the, the lung cancer data set. We simply click on the um, MSCA option. In this case, we're just going to choose uh, ORA. It uses uh, lists particularly found in KEG. As we said, it's, it's a weaker analysis. It's just looking at word or text frequency. Ideally, we'd like to move this from KEG into um, HMDB because there's much, much richer data, or SMIPDB because there's much richer data. Um, but this is uh, one of the things where if you've used a list, you want to make sure you're using the proper names. And in this particular list, uh, someone had misspelled um, isoleucine, I think. They forgot to put the E in. So there is a, a name normalization or name standardization that's actually built into uh, 
metaboanalyst because we've spent many years trying to get name normalization and comparison standardized in HMDB. So it looks at your name list and, and says, maybe there's a problem here. Do you want to make a correction? Uh, you've misspelled isoleucine. We've done the correction. Then I think, as I said, that the real key to this MSCA are these uh, eight or nine different um, uh, libraries. So some are pathway-specific libraries, some are disease-specific libraries, some are SNP-specific libraries. Unfortunately, a lot of people just choose the top option and say, I've done it. Uh, that's probably not the most interesting one to, to use, and it may depend on your specific application that you want to look at. Uh, in this case, we just chose the top default. Uh, and again, these are people suffering from cancer and muscle wasting. And one of the, the well, the first few that we see basically are uh, protein metabolism and amino acid metabolism are, are all messed up uh, in these individuals. And that's highlighted in terms of the red ranking, and then things fall in terms of their relative importance. Um, and then we can... What's that? What is the meaning of P? P here is the... <coughs> Is it a fold enrichment or the p? This is a lot like the p value. It's just like 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3. Um, so the lower the p value, more significant, the darker the red color. So if you scroll down, there's a table um, which will give you some more details, including the FDR. Um, P value, the expected value, the total number of hits based on the frequency of those terms and these different um, the expect value. Um, I think that's calculated the same way that um, um, blast values are done, but Jeff might be able to give you an idea. I don't use that. Uh, I just use the FDR, and I, I think that's obviously the more relevant. So if we use the FDR, why would be the cutoff? Where is the cutoff? Yeah. Again, it's sort of arbitrary, uh, but most people use an FDR of 0 0.05. Um, but you can use an alpha value of 0 0.01. You could use an alpha value of 0 0.1. Um, you just need to either explain it, um, why you've chosen that. I saw in gene investment analysis, they use um, 0.25. 0.25? Yeah. I guess if, if you want to do that. Um, I don't know where actually I should start. This is where I think there's, there's obviously lots of debate. Um, 0.05 is something that uh, was never actually suggested. Uh, it just sort of became a standard. and. and people will, will die on a sword if someone's at 0 0.06 or 0 0.04. Um, and it's silly. Um, but um, if, if you want to use 0.25, fine. Um, and all you need to do is, if you're explaining it, you just simply said, based on how other people have done it, this is how I've chosen to do it. Um, you're just trying to reduce the, the frequency of false discoveries. So if you can live with a um, a 5% rate of false discovery or a 25% rate of false discovery, that's fine. You know, sometimes, um, like, uh, data is not recognized. So let's say I have uh, some metabolites, like, six metabolites. It should be hit with uh, some pathway, but um, uh, there is only two um, ID. So four already, they are not counted. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, case they are showing the um, FDR value is 0.12 or something. But I know they already uh, did not recognize another 4. If 4 include over there, the uh, FDR value can be going around 0 0.005 something. So what, can I put that and argue this thing? I'm not sure, and I think that's something, just given our time constraints, because we have to be done in a few minutes, I won't have time to answer that now. We could talk about it at lunch if you want. Um, so in terms of just looking at um, the, the results, this is simply giving you a little more detailed. You can click on things. It'll give you a certain view. You can also select the pathways, and it'll explore or allow you to explore them in more detail. So they are linked to the SMIPDB pathway set now. 
single sample profiling, um, as I said, this is basically what would be equivalent for a physician to do this. It's one person, so we've chosen one, one sample in this case, not all of them. So it's one person. We're just looking at, at their metabolites. There's about 50 or so, 60 that are listed, and we're just seeing um, what's high or what's low. In this case, we have uh, the HMDB has large sets of referential metabolite uh, concentration values from multiple studies. We're looking at threonine in this case, and we've clicked on threonine in more detail. You can see that there are four reported studies looking at threonine concentrations in the urine, and you can see that uh, three are pretty tight, and then there's a fourth one that's kind of off in terms of its study one. But the concentration for this person is way above normal. So they're dumping large amounts of threonine in, in their urine as it normalized to creatinine. So this suggests that this person has something wrong, uh, and it's probably related to cachexia and probably related to amino acid metabolism. We can go further, which as I said is more typical of MSCA, and this is looking at a population, not an individual. Um, and in this case, we're looking at the whole set of cachexic and non-cachexic uh, individuals. And the result here is, is similar to what we saw with the, um, over uh, the aura, um, over representation analysis. You have a plot which ranges from yellow to red, with p-values ranging from minuscule to very significant. You have the, the table, um, and in this case it's identifying collections of pathway-related metabolites. In this case, we're looking at um, was it pruvic acid uh, uh, metabolism. And so in this case, these are uh, metabolites, uh, including ascorbic acid, pyruvate, lactic acid, uh, that are quite significant and that are very significantly different for people uh, with cachexia. So this is a way of, of seeing or identifying pathways that are perturbed, in this case, for people who have cachexia and cancer. Um, it's done on a pathway basis, but we could have done it on a disease basis, uh, on a, a, a SNP basis. Um, uh, any of these nine different modules that are contained in uh, MSCA could have been explored in more detail. Now, this one has already suggested some pathways that are different for people in cancer, so we could actually go to the real pathway analysis module and look to see what is different for them. So the MSCA gave us some hints. It could have also, instead of just, as I said, using pathways, we could have looked at um, locational differences of metabolites or, or looked at a few other things. But this is strictly for pathways, and it's perhaps a little more detailed. Um, the pathway analysis is not restricted to humans. It works for 21 model organisms. So humans are included, but you can also work with mice, which are the equivalent for rats, Drosophila, Arabidopsis, E. coli, and yeast. Now right now we're just using the keg pathways, but we're trying to migrate to the SMIP or PathWiz pathways that we introduced you to uh, because they're much more comprehensive and generally more complete than the keg pathways. In this case, just for example, we're using the same human data set that we did before. This is lung and colon cancer, uh, and we're looking at urine. So if we're doing that, we just click on pathway analysis. We choose that pathway or that uh, data set. But to do pathway analysis, we have to do a little bit more than what we're doing with metabolite set enrichment analysis. We actually have to do the same normalization that we, or similar kind of normalization. So the optimal parameters for this one are given here where we referenced it to use a specific reference sample. We did auto-scaling uh, to get things normalized. I'm not going to show the picture because it looks normal after this. And then we can choose our pathway libraries. So the input is a human data, so we don't choose E. coli. We choose human. So make sure you choose the right organism. So here's the options. It's a 21. And at this stage, you can start doing some of your pathway analysis. And there's several options, uh, and they're explained in more detail in the uh, current protocols in bioinformatics, which is that on the web now? People can, can read it if they wish. 
Um, so different options. Yes. Yes, you would want the names, uh, although you can have you know, arbitrary names. Um, um, but uh, if you have too many of them, it won't see any pathways because you're looking at keg. So if you've got, I don't know, 80% of the compounds with, with names and 20% which are unidentified, then maybe you'll be able to get some, some pathway analysis. It's not going to map the unknowns to anything, but um, if you think it's um, useful. But in the end, yeah, you, you've got to have a, a good number of compound names, uh, and you need to have some relative concentration or absolute concentration data that helps distinguish things. Um, so we've chosen the default ones, and the default ones are actually generally pretty good. Uh, the point is that different pathways have different levels of com complexity and connectivity. And people have identified what we call hubs. Um, so there's a red um, uh, circles are examples of hubs. There are things like bottlenecks. So the blue circle is an example of a bottleneck. Uh, and in the world of graph theory, people can talk about degree centra centrality and between centrality, which are sort of ways of measuring things. And so something that has that is a bottleneck has high betweenness centrality, and something that is a hub has high degree centrality. So if you're a topologist, then that's cool. But what most people typically want to do is they just plot out these types of plots. These are circle uh, intensity plots. They're plotting the pathway impact versus the uh, log p. Um, so significance. So as you go up, negative log p. So the higher up to the upper right, <coughs> the more important. The bigger the circle, the more metabolites that are involved, and the greater significance statistically. So we've got something that's way over on the right, top right corner, and that one is glycine serine metabolism. And what you, what's happened is that our, uh, we've highlighted the pathway. Question. Sorry. How, um, what is the meaning of pathway What is the cutoff for the pathway impact? Uh, there's no formal cutoff for pathway impact, but it's, it's calculated, the description and the calculation, I think, is in the original paper. Uh, I don't remember exactly the formula. Jeff might be able to tell you. The main thing behind this is that uh, is uh, in the sand, in the hub, in the upstream, is have more impact. So if you are the case, it's more located in a strategic or important location, the impact is that you have more weight than when the low last bottom from the downstream. So it's just a rank. There's no cutoff, it's just a rank. So ultimately, um, the, the rule of thumb is to choose things that are on the upper right corners. Um, they're the ones that are more significant. In this case, we've got about eight or nine metabolites in this particular pathway that are identified as being significantly different. Um, that's why the circle is a little larger. If we only had one or two metabolites, the circle would be smaller. Um, it has a Google Map-like browsing function, so you can zoom in. Um, and if you zoom in, you can also click on specific metabolites. Now you'll notice that these are only giving the keg identifiers, not um, the actual name. So if you want to know the name, you have to click on the identifier. A pop-up box is presented, and that's showing the actual metabolite, as well as the difference between the cases and the controls, the cachexia and the non-cachexia. Yes? In your pop-ups, is that the normalized data, or is that the original data? What's what? Yes, that's a good point. Um, it it would be the... Yeah, so this one is normalized? Yeah. There will be some plots, I think, that will show the original data, but others, in this case, will show definitely the, the adjusted, normalized, scaled, transformed data. So there isn't a capability to show both those things. You know, because I'm thinking, if, if I was reviewing this paper, I, want to, I probably want to go back and look at the original data, the actual yeah. number, yeah. as well as the, the, the yeah. transformed data. I mean, ultimately, they, they would look the same. Um, in, in terms of both the, the distribution, it's just the, the, the number would be different. 
Um, so I think you'd be able to generate a box plot, probably not through Metabolalis, but with other tools just to say, this is the one I want to show, I want to make a nice plot for it. Because I would not use the pop-up box plots um, in, in, a, in, a, in a paper. They're just too low resolution. Um, so if, if I found something that's really cool and I want to emphasize this and I want to put that in my paper, I would just use a separate tool. But you would get something that would look a lot like this. Uh, it's just because of the scaling, it, it's, it has a different uh, yeah, y-axis. Yeah, if you want to regenerate the original one, you just don't use this pop-up. It's all the other ANOVA tests. You do have this uh, original constitution box plot with the original one with high resolution. So here it's just for convenience of see it there, but it's not for your your after Okay, so in terms of a more detailed explanation of the pathway impact, is to say it's sort of a, a fuzzy method. So it in includes the log fold change, the differential ex express metabolites, the statistical significance, the topology, and it, it sort of combines it all into one measure. So it's, it's a bit of an arm wa waving one, but it, it is a rank score, as Jeff said. And so um, it's, it's really just allowing you to say this is more important than the other one. You can also get a tabular result, uh, and as before, everything has a, a column. Many things are uh, hyperlinked, so things will be hyperlinked uh, to the pathways, uh, both to KEG and to the small molecule pathway database. Um, and they'll have the false discovery rates, as well as the p-values and others. Another one that you can apply or do is, is also uh, a biomarker analysis. And um, this is further down, and this is particularly useful given that many people are starting to use metabolites for biomarkers. Jeff talked about the receiver-operated characteristic curve or rock curves. Um, what you're trying to do with biomarkers is you want to maximize your area under the curve, maximize the AUC, and minimize the number of metabolites in a biomarker panel. Many people doing biomarkers in transcriptomics, proteomics, and metabolomics completely miss this concept. And they'll propose or publish a biomarker panel with you know, 200 genes or 50 proteins. No one in their right mind is ever going to commercialize or use that kind of test because it would cost thousands and thousands of dollars. What most commercial or clinically approved tests have are one, two, or three markers. And that's just for practical purposes. So you want to minimize the number of molecules, whether it's metabolites, proteins, or genes, but you want to maximize the area under the curve. So there's three different modules that, that um, the biomarker analysis module has. One is for um, a single marker analysis, a uh, univariate one. There's a multivariate one. And then there's some people who believe they have a better idea than the computer, and so they'll manually choose um, certain marker sets. And in fact, sometimes that works better. So you have a simple module, simple cut, click, and paste sort of thing where you can choose your, your in this case, uh, a data set. We're uploading one. Um, this was a set of 90 patients, uh, women, uh, expectant mothers, three months. They gave some blood samples. 45 of those went on to develop preeclampsia, which is a high blood pressure condition, which is quite risky for the infant and the mother. And then 45 of those had normal pregnancies. So this was to try and have a predictive marker for preeclampsia. So that once a person has found that they're pregnant, they could have a quick blood test and they could determine whether they're at risk for preeclampsia. And there's some very simple um, prophylactic strategies for that. Basically, uh, an aspirin a day will prevent the preeclampsia if you are one who is prone to it. So with this, we upload the data just as before. We do a data integrity check. Everything checks out just fine. As before, with the cow samples, these are for women. We're doing uh, a data normalization, just like we did before. On the left, we see a highly skewed distribution. On the right, we see a, a highly normalized distribution. It looks very Gaussian, so this is good. And so we can start doing some statistics. And this is where we're doing the biomarker evaluation. So we want to look for a couple of biomarkers, not one. So we're going to do the multivariate one. And so we click that option. And then a, a few seconds later, this is the rock curve. 
And if you've seen pictures of rock curves, this is an exceptional one. And it's showing different colors for different numbers of metabolites. There are uh, it's a rock curve with two metabolites, a rock curve with three, five, and ten. And really the one at two doesn't differ a whole lot from the ones with ten and twenty. So at this stage you can say probably a biomarker panel of two or three metabolites will be sufficient to predict uh, women at early pregnancy who will develop preeclampsia. Um, you can go a little further and then try and um, you know, assess the model a little further. Uh, this uses a, an SVM, a smart vector machine model. You can get uh, an adjustment for the possible ranges. Uh, and I guess with rock curves you have to remember that you can get highly optimal ones and not so optimal ones. So this is essentially doing a permutation test uh, and it generates a range. And that's marked in the sort of the purple or light blue uh, which represents the range and then the middle line represents the average which gives you the area under the curve of about 94.94. So we've got a great rock curve. What are the, the couple of metabolites that are so helpful? So at this stage you can scroll through a little bit further and view things. And what comes out through the VIP plot is that it's uh, glycerol and I think it's 3-hydroxybutyrate, I think, uh, which becomes substantially different. And looking at the VIP scores, there's several that probably could be used, and if I was just looking at the range, I'd, I'd probably choose four uh, metabolites as, as probably the best ones. But if you're developing a test, you probably want to have something that's you know easy to measure and consistent, and so you might say, well, glycerol's a pain, but hydroxybutyrate isn't, so I'd use that one and then one other. And this is the sort of thinking that you have to have when you're thinking about biomarkers. Um, maybe the best one isn't the easiest to measure, but the second and the third best one are and that becomes your biomarker panel. Another technique that's often used and often asked, especially for people writing grants, but also trying to design experiments, is called power analysis. Uh, this is common in medical grants. It's also common in veterinary practices where they have to determine how many samples do we have to collect and uh, what point will we say that our study is too small or too big or just the right size. So you're generally wanting to find a, a condition where you can choose the number of samples or patients where you have a power of about 0.8. That's sort of the consensus cutoff. 0.8 means you've got an 80 percent chance of ending up with a statistically significant result. Some people may want a 90 percent, some may want a 99 percent. Again, it's up to you, but the consensus that a lot of people are happy with is around 80 percent. So if that's the case and you're trying to look at a sample of cows or people or plants, how many do you need to test? And most of us just do this very arbitrarily and say, well, someone gave me 70 samples, that's what I'll use. Uh, and it might be that's far too few or maybe it's far too many. And this is the point about power analysis and you can design your study. But to really do this, um, you have to have some preliminary data. Now, to get a more powerful study, larger sample sizes are better. That's just a rule. That's obvious. Um, there's a, a thing called an effect size, um, which is uh, how significant is the markers or the, the chemicals or the genes or the proteins that you're looking for how different are they between the, the control and the cases? Um, and that's where you actually need some preliminary results. And this is the whole point about power calculation, is you need to have had at least a sample, a pilot study done, to be able to determine this. So with a pilot data, uh, a few, maybe 10 samples, uh, you might look and you'll choose a criteria. Most people use 0.05. You might use a false discovery rate of 0.05 or 0.1. Um, and you want to figure out what's my power and how big does my sample have to be. So once you've uploaded a sample set, a small pilot set, you run it through this power analysis curve and say we uploaded 10 samples. What this says is that in order to get um, sufficient power, to get 80%, you're going to have to have about 60 uh, samples, uh, both of cases and control. Now, this was one where there's an, a relatively um, strong effect size. 
but there are many examples where you're going to need uh, a thousand to be able to distinguish things. In the case of GWAS, the numbers are often around 10,000 to 100,000. Fortunately, metabolomics, most people are able to get things um, quite significantly distinct with a few hundred to maybe uh, at most a couple thousand. So we've at, we're out of time. I'm four minutes over time, and I think people are hungry. Uh, so we're not going to cover some of the other things that are available, clustering, uh, classification time series, two-factor analysis. Um, these are some examples that are shown in the um, CPIB chapter that you guys can download. Uh, and this is an example of the integrative pathway analysis. Thank you.